Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is our first uh, webcast with VMUG as Tintree by DDN. So um, we're, we're really happy to be here and we're happy to present uh, today's topic, which is around storage of emotion. Uh, we think it's fantastic and we just want to question, you know, how can we possibly make it better? So if you've got any questions, feel free to shoot them, uh, but we will do Q&A at the end uh, as well. So, um, you know, the, the V-Motion revolution, this is, this is really what changed the computing industry and, and flipped it on its head. Um, and so uh, V-Motion itself was introduced back in 2003, so about five years out of uh, VMware's existence. And that came in uh, Virtual Center 1.0. Um, you know, that was amazing. That is taking the contents of your memory and compute and being able to move it. And so here you could be in a VM, you got a workload, and now you can move that to a different piece of hardware and it doesn't even have to be from the same vendor. And then we went on to do the same thing for storage. So now we could move storage uh, while our workloads are still running, which is, which is quite an amazing feat. And vMotion continues to get better uh, with every release. Uh, some of the newer additions to uh, vMotion were the ability to do like cross vCenter vMotion, uh, vMotion without any shared storage, so like share nothing, long distance migration to be able to uh, enable a bunch of hybrid cloud use cases, and you know the list goes on. Tomer, any any comments? Yeah, so like like the slide says, right? These are just the recent additions. I think VMware did an awesome job in adding very interesting features over the years, right? So we have 15 years of development here, and this is honestly why we're so excited, and we wanted to dedicate this session to uh, storage vMotion. So uh, why why would you uh, do you know reasons for storage vMotioning, and it really comes down to two things: uh, capacity and performance. And so as we started to look at all the possible use cases and stuff about capacity and performance, uh, we thought, yeah, it really just comes back to those two. So uh, let's say that you're out of space on a uh, an existing array, you're going to buy a new one, uh, you know. That really comes down to, you know, you don't have the space, you want new ones. But then we thought about it and economics comes into the picture. So it, it really just isn't performance capacity because capacity comes in many flavors. You could have very high performing capacity that's very expensive and you can have some cheap and deep capacity that isn't as expensive. So we end up tiering between these to achieve uh, an economic balance. And same thing economics applies to older hardware you you know it, it at some point your hardware isn't worth the power and cooling uh for the value that it gives you and you've got maintenance agreements and stuff on it so you want to get off of that and so we figured that was it and then it occurred to us well security might be one more reason so if you have uh encryption on a certain storage device that's not on another then you want to move over, uh, move those workloads over so that they can take advantage of that, um, that, that encryption. And then uh, once I thought the list was finally done, I realized like, well, okay, I'll, I might do storage vMotion for some housekeeping. So uh, I might rethin a VM. Uh, maybe I deployed a VM as thick and I want to thin it. Uh, storage vMotion is one of the ways to convert our disk formats. Also renaming, so you've, you've got uh, VMs in there, uh, somebody, you know, gives it a name and then the, the FQDN inside the VM is something different. You want to true it up to make sense in your environment and you rename the VM, but it drives you crazy because if you're actually looking in the file system and looking for the folder of that name, uh, that won't be the new name and your VDisks won't be that name. So a storage vMotion will also true up all of that stuff. Yeah, so these are not foreign concepts, right? I mean, uh, I'm probably most people on the call have used storage vMotion for one or more of those reasons, right? The most common one is probably capacity, I would say. Uh, maybe one afterwards uh, is performance, right? But in many cases, your data store is about to explode, right? You need to make some room. You use storage vMotion to move a VM off of it, right? That's, you know, that happens daily or multiple times a day sometimes. And, and as a storage vendor, we love it because VMs are so portable. Uh, we can bring in a POC. Someone can move their workload onto it. Hey, this is fantastic. I love it. Um, and 
and if they want to move it off it, they can do that too. I mean, it's not uh, it's not trapped uh, by any means, and it's not the lift that it used to be to like say move a part of a file share where you've got to go back through all your scripts and and everybody's you know recents and in, in all their office apps and everything gets screwed up because uh, the the you know files don't exist where they used to. So this is really awesome, and and really it comes down to planned and unplanned. So. Planned is, uh, okay, this this box, we're going to get rid of it by uh, the end of the year. You know, we can take our time with maintenance windows and move it on our, you know, at our leisure. But then there's also unplanned. So unplanned is, uh, oh, crap, uh, this thing's just about full. Um, we need to move stuff off. And so sometimes we're moving inside of an array. And, uh, and we've got a bunch of data stores that are cut from LUNs and volumes. And we, we move that way to, to get on different tiers. Uh, there, there's a variety of reasons for that. And uh, so if we're about to fill one up, then, then maybe we've got to vacate and make room for another. Uh, so those are all reasons to do it. So let's just jump into lab because I don't want to PowerPoint you to death. And no one can accuse me of not doing any demo time. So... Let's just take a really simple use case here, and I'm just going to jump on here. I'm going to create two VMs, and all I'm going to do is create uh, some blank disks in this, in this example. So I'll call this two terabyte VMware, and I'll just put that in my motion testing I'll drop it on this host I'll throw it on this array this is good I'm not actually gonna put an OS so that's fine I am gonna change it to make it thin instead of thick lazy zeroed and finish and now I want to take this uh, VM and I want to move this this empty two terabyte VM over. So um, we currently have it on a, an EC6090, which is the the uh, biggest, baddest in our all flash lineup. And we're going to move it over to an EC6070, which is also a pretty sweet bad box. So let's just jump into here. Just and to, just to reiterate, right? This this is an empty VM, right? It doesn't have any data in it, right? Just a, a, a shell of a VDS, right? Very large provision size, two terabytes. So on, a, if you're familiar with Tintry uh, VM stores, those that's what we call our arrays. Uh, there's no LUNs and volumes. We just have one large data store that represents all the space in it. So in this case, we want to move it to the 6070. Next, finish. And we will see that the relocate has started. Now, if I go over and I take a look at uh, throughput on the 6090, I'll just get a little graph for this. And I'll split it. And what I can see, yellow is read. So we're reading at uh, 1,400... 1450 megabytes per second, so a little over a 10 gig link. I do have 40 gig NICs in here. Um, and uh, we can see that we've got a bit of network latency here um, in, in our stack graph. And then so, if, you know, we're, we're reading and on the far side, we will look for those writes. But we might get a little frustrated because they're not going to show up. So where are the writes? Well, so there's no need to write zeros. Uh, and so that's what uh, vSphere does is when you're reading zeros, it will it will not it does not need to write them until it gets to the next contiguous piece of data. And so then when you're when you're on data, then it will write. But in this case, there's there's nothing. So um, the the reads themselves are coming through. Uh, we, we read a big chunk off of this thing. And we uh, we've already completed yeah, this. I think, I think it was actually provisioned for lower than you know what? two terabytes. I, I I didn't change the size, and I yeah. don't know if somebody in the comments did that. So yeah. 
So that's how long 40 gig takes. Apology, folks. So 2 TB. This one's for real. And so let's just drop it in the same place. Drop it on the same host. Next, we'll move it to our 60. We'll put it on our start it on our 6090. Yeah, everything. Default. And this time around, I was so concerned about getting it thin that I forgot to change the size to two terabytes. So now we're at two terabytes. And let's try this again. And we will just do a migrate. Drop it on our 6070. Yeah, I, so 1400 megabytes a second is, is respectable. Um, I, I, I'd be, I was, I was a little shocked when somehow it could have finished two terabytes in uh, <laughs> such a short amount of time. <clears throat> yeah. So we'll see the same thing. We're going to see the reads on that and we won't see any writes on this side. So on our graphs on the left side, these are all 10 minute averages that we can go back up to a week and everything you see coming through on the right side are all 10 second averages. So this is our real time stuff, everything right of that real time line. So I'll just leave this. And so right now what's happening is uh, our host is, is working really hard. This pop-up keeps coming is working really hard to read this. So this has to be read through the host, which is in the data path, right? Which may be disruptive to other VMs that are uh, sharing the same host. It may be disruptive to other VMs that might be sharing the same blade chassis or rack uh, or have any kind of bottlenecks in the network that are in common with, uh, with this workflow. Yeah, and the point that we wanted to highlight here is that, or one of the points is that there's actually no data to move, right? This is just provision space and it's all zeros. So if we, if we, uh, you know, provision large sizes of this, and we're going to talk about it later, but we're going to pay for it when we migrate those VMs. And that's exactly what we see here. Now, if you have the ability to track, you know, IOs per VM, then you can actually see that load. But in many cases, it just gets blend with, you know, IOs from other VMs on your data store right so in the in the tintry case we're, we're fortunate that we can um do things such as click on a, on a point in time in the graph and right here we can see who the top 10 contributors are so this is a, a vm by the name of four by one terabyte partially filled clone and this was me doing it last night 7 p.m and me doing it again around 1 a.m and some later stuff in preparation for today. So we're, um, you know, it's it's really nice to see exactly who's doing what. Uh, that's that's one of the big Tintry value props here. And then to be able to get in on a, a per machine level, we can get in and see our, our particular machines and and see this uh, the rates and graphs per machine. So let's get back on track here. So you know, is is a blank V disk realistic? Um, I I think it is. Um, but not, you know, completely blank all the time. However, I think that it's realistic from a template perspective. So you've got a, uh, a template of an OS, and uh, let's say that it's Windows, you've got a 50 gig uh, C drive, and then you've allocated, uh, I don't know, one, 200 gigs of D drive, and it's empty. People uh, provision it as they need to. Uh, they clone it. Hopefully they get some very fast cloning doing this. And then for whatever reason, that VM has to move to a different destination. Now, if you don't have headroom, like even, even if we didn't have a data disk and we were just talking about our, our base OS disk, we would want to have headroom for the guest inside. If we don't, the guest is going to crash. So what's an appropriate amount of headroom? Uh, my, my rule of thumb is fill up your VDisk and, and size your VDisk so that the amount of data that you, you need in it is about 50% and then let it grow till about 75% inside. And um, if you can compare your you know, logical live size to your provision size, this would be how much you've unthinned it. Once you hit that 75%, expand it again so that uh, the data in there is the new 50%. And keep repeating that. So as you repeat that, your overhead, 
the the free part, which is thin provisioned, um, it doesn't take up any storage space. So it, it, it does seem very free and uh, will accommodate you, you know, growing those OSs, no problem. And you don't have to, you know, if you don't have much headroom, you constantly got to be extending these disks. And uh, maybe you can do that by automation. But even when you're doing it by automation, you still want to have some headroom. So you're paying for that headroom in terms of portability. So uh, storage vMotion, there's, there's more challenges. Tomer, you want to chat for a bit here? Yeah, so I can cover a few of those. Um, so we've seen the first one, right, um, that the host has to read the entire provision space no matter what, right? Even if you have zeros in it, it was, you know, it was a pretty simple example, right? Probably won't happen in reality. You'll never have a, a two terabyte disk and just, uh, you know, provision then move it. But this is just to make the point. But and this also what uh, causes storage remotion to take a long time, right? The process uh, is somewhat efficient, but there's some inefficiencies there, right? Uh, so storage remotion takes a long time. And during the time of storage remotion, and I'm sure many of you have seen that, uh, you know, working in our environments, the VM is unmanageable, right? So you can't take actions, right? You can't snapshot it, you can't back it up, right? So during the, that amount of time, um, you're at risk of, uh, you know, going outside of your SLA or breaching your SLAs. So I can't, yeah, I can't power it on, I can't power it off, I can't move it to another host. So let's say that, uh, you know, we we need to just do a normal vMotion while we're doing the storage vMotion. Right. So you're, you're at risk for many reasons, right? And yeah, as you mentioned with backups, that's a huge risk. You're going to breach your SLAs because your backup uh provider needs to take a snapshot in many cases right. may not be able to do so and and now all of a sudden you reach your cell and, right? and and you know this doesn't matter for vms that are you know 10 20 gigs in size right. but if you if you've got vms that are tens of terabytes or, or possibly hundreds of terabytes this is this is a pretty big deal right and then we talked about the planned versus unplanned right so let's say you have this huge vm you want to move it in a maintenance window right that maintenance window is often your backup window as well, right? So you, you spend the night moving a VM around, but then that VM won't be backed up at that time. So, so you're breaching your SLAs. Uh, another thing that is really, really critical uh, to anyone who's using storage level snapshot, right? So array level snapshots. And you know, on the Tintree side, we have awesome snapshots, right? We can snap at the VM level, but those snapshots are left behind when you use storage remotion. So you know, the VM moves to the new destination with the new uh, storage array, but all the historical snapshots you had are left on the original array. And that causes another problem because if you moved a VM to clear space, right, you actually haven't cleared any space because the snapshot that is left behind uses all the space of, of that VM or almost all, all the space, right? Uh, just, you know, you're just saving the latest Delta. So you're actually not, <clears throat> not uh, saving any space or not moving data uh, for clearing space on the source unless you delete the snapshot. And then again, you might breach your SLA as well. So that's very problematic. So, so let's take just a, a quick look while this is happening here, going off script a bit, because yeah. that's how I roll. Yep. Um, here's a VM, uh, about 40 gigs, and it lives <coughs> on that 6090. So let's go over to that 6090 and find that VM. Here it is, uh, Win 2016-1, and we'll right-click on this guy, and we have a protection policy, okay? And uh, so our policy might be lost. So future snapshots right. when it gets to the other side might be lost. But also the active snapshots, and if we say right-click on this VM and say view snapshots, here's all the snapshots for this particular VM um, that would be left behind. Now this thing has been idle, so there's not much data change in it. Um, but you know there were some snaps early on. Now these snaps are still useful; you can clone them. But if you're moving this VM to free up space, the reality is is most of the space is actually in these snapshots. Right whether it's the, the base it's cloned from or its own snaps. And, and now you've just made a copy over to somewhere else and you've left these binds so you don't actually reclaim your space until you get rid of this too. Right, and then when you get rid of those, you'll, you lose your historical data points, right, which is, which is another issue. 
So uh, so let's um, just pr prove this one out and, <laughs> uh, and and just start moving it because uh, one of the challenges in a uh, session of this length is I wish that would pop up is the um, you know these operations take a while and we don't necessarily have a long time for this. So let me just go to migrate this guy to our 6070. And we're going to do a chain storage only. And this is a running VM. And we want to just go to our 6070. Next, finish. So this will complete pretty quickly, right? It's, a, it's not a big VM. Well, it's got to compete with the other potentially, but yeah. Right. So and we can see that one. uh yeah. it's incremented a bit and so now we are reading off at about 2000 gigabytes per second two, um 2 gigabytes per second oh, sorry sorry 2 gigabytes per second yeah thank you <laughs> well that's why that's that, the next that's the next why that 2 terabyte one finished yeah. so fast yeah and so that one actually has some writes going on all right and that's because it's not an empty VM. So we have a bit of rights. And let's go back because we've got this illustrated in our slides. Well, I think we've pretty much covered most of this here. Yeah. So actually, the last part is is what's on the right top right of this slide, right? Which is uh, the resources required, right? So so that's what we alluded to earlier when we're saying that you know you use those resources, right? So. So no matter if you're moving real bits or just reading zeros, you're using host resources and you're using your storage data path, right? Because the host has to read and then it has to write if there's actually data. Uh, so those resources that are consumed may impact other uh, VMs that are running on that same host on the same, uh, you know, blade or or blade chassis or, or you know network segment or you know whatever is common between the VM that is moving and the other VMs around it. And uh, I could jump in per VM and, and find if, if they're being impacted with, with latency and stuff, because most aren't running workloads. It's it's not gonna, sh there isn't demand for IO, so yeah. there isn't IO to have uh, latency on per se, but this is so, something we could dive into. Yeah, so we actually have the next slide that shows us uh, a real scenario that uh, took place by the end of the year, you can see December 27th is the day there. And I, I was, that was actually me working on a production environment. I was a, on a data center, you know, operations duty, right? Just in case something happens, you know, jump on and, and, and you know, and address the situation. And that's exactly what I did. So we had a VM store, right? One of the Tintree arrays that uh, was about to become full and I had to move a VM off of it. And I used storage emotion, right? It's the first thing, I just found a VM that had the right characteristics, right? It, it didn't get a lot of dedupe on our source array. That's another thing we can get to uh, in a second, but uh, it was a good candidate to move. And then I started migrating it. And you can see in this uh, in this screenshot, right, the top part shows us the IOPS. And, you know, we got some pretty, pretty high IOPS there for that migration. But about an hour into the storage remotion, we started seeing this host latency uh, that just existed on the host uh, and impacted other VMs that ran on that same host. So even though you know I was achieving the goal of you know clearing space and moving this VM off, I was impacting other VMs, and there was no way way around it. Well, maybe there is a way around it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So this is to the part of how do we make it better. Right, and uh, so what we wanted to share with you is uh, our new feature, our newest addition to um, you know to the Tintree set of uh, features that we have, uh, and this is the ability to offload the the uh, VM migration process. And what we mean by offload is that if we could take you know some of the data, bulk of the data, all the data potentially, right, and move that without the host involvement, we can really improve the process. Right. And this is exactly what we've done, right? So we've we've actually used Tintree technology, right? We've had uh, Tintree replication, right, since version two, I guess, right? Rob, you've been an early. Yeah, I was I was beta that. for that, and back in 2013, I think. Right. So, so, so we have the ability to replicate data between arrays, and many storage vendor has that, right? But we also have VM level granularity for that data, so that means that we can 
uh, prep or, or, or stage the VM's data uh, prior to actually running a storage remotion. So essentially there's no way around moving, uh, uh, around uh, executing storage remotion to migrate uh, virtual machines. But what if that storage remotion can complete much faster because the data is already there at the destination? Right, and that's exactly what we're doing here. So we're moving the data between the arrays, and once the data is there, we're telling the host, okay, now go and do a storage remotion. And by the way, the data is already there, uh, so all the, uh, the host has to do is migrate the remaining pieces of that VM, which is uh, the non-volatile uh, information, right? All the, the home directory uh, information is there. Yeah, and I, did you cover the, the data path? <coughs> can be through the data network or can be uh, through a dedicated replication right. network. Uh, we've got a, an option on our boxes for uh, a, a replication NIC, and this works across uh, the whole uh, Tintree VM store lineup. So whether that is uh, all flashes, hybrids, or even our older hybrids, um, all of them can, you know, can participate in this. Uh, yeah, which is which is great. Yeah, so so in in order for this to work, right, in the back end, we actually orchestrate a pretty sophisticated workflow, right? And we'll we want to show you this in you know live, but this is actually I mean essentially what happens when you hit the migrate button, but you do it from the Tintree side. So we we relocate the snapshots, right? We relocate the or we move or copy the snapshot policy, the protection policy that Rob showed you earlier. Right, and and we take all these steps in order for for the whole process to work and make it seamless uh, to the end user. And we'll talk about this later. But what we actually wanted to do is move to the lab again and show you how this works. So uh, I'm a big fan of apples to apples comparisons. Um, so we'll we'll do an apples to apples comparisons uh, of each of these. Right. So, so let's, let's do another two terabyte VM. Yeah. So our first one is still going. Uh, tortoise in the hair. It's got a bit of a head start here, right? Now let's uh, uh, let's jump in, and we'll even go on the same host. Again, apples to apples, new VM. And this time I, I will type in two terabytes. I won't game it with the wrong wrong disk size. Pay attention, guys. So Rob, keep me on honest here. Trick us here. Yeah. And we'll uh, deploy it to the same VM store as well. And uh, in this case, we're going to say thin. And we're going to change it to two terabytes, right? Finish. So now, ah. Uh, yeah, we wanted to get it on the 6070, and I put it on the 6090. Right. So, so let's, let's migrate. Let's move it over. So let's go into Tintree Global Center and find that VM. So I'll just search for number two. Maybe that's enough for it to come up. If not, 2TB. But let's just see if this uh, brings back too many results. Yeah. Close enough. Cool. Okay. So this is the one we want to migrate. So we're just going to go here. And we're just going to say migrate up at the top. And this is Tintree Global Center 4.0, which was released. Uh, it went GA in December of last year, 2018. Now we want to move it. And we'll put it over to our 6070. And uh, this is the data store, the logical data store that, that VMware that, that shows up in the vCenter. Um, and so if you had multiple mounts on it, those would show here as well. And we're just going to say migrate. So it started successfully. And here we've got a little status that's performing a live migration. And we'll go back to vCenter. And what we can see is that a, um, a VMware snapshot was created uh, called 2TB-Tintree. We did a reconfiguration. So this was us doing a little monkey in behind the scenes. And 
uh, if we were to look at our reads, we, we do not see any increases in reads. Now I can see that there's this bubble here in the middle. This was that other VM that I that I, I sent over, right? This one had the right. That's a forty terabyte. Right. Oh, sorry, for forty gigabyte. And and we can see that lined up exactly in the same spot where the data from that, you know, the ten gigs of data or so from that forty gig VM. And uh, and then it didn't write the zeros at the end, but it continued to read the zeros. And uh, this is where we can look at Global Center. See, it's it's still underway here. Yeah, Rob, if you go to the 6070 again and check the VM, see if something came in. So virtual machines. Let me refresh this. And you can check the snapshots as well. We'll have a snapshot in a second. Yeah, all right. So I can see that there's a, a 2 TB VMware. This one was actually that 40 gig one. That was a, right? Provision size 40. Uh, here is, this is a synthetic. So it's, um, this means there's a snapshot, but no VM yet. And, uh, and we can see that because it says from source. So it's not in inventory and it's also uh, in italics here. So we look over at our snapshots and we can see that we have a uh, vMotion offload snapshot that had landed for this, which is one of the last uh, steps in the process. And if we look over here, we can see there were four things done. Uh, the last one being remove that um, that VMware snapshot. So it was this create VMware snapshot and remove it. That's that's handling the delta and some of the stuff in the middle while we're doing the stuff on the back end. And what's really cool here is that th this VM was was not locked up to do anything else during this process. We can we can still do all of our operations and stuff with it because everything is happening on the back. All right, so, so what, what actually happened here? And the thing is that the process is completed, right? We can see, we can go we go back to TGC, Tintree Global Center, so right? We it's, can it's see done. it's here. We should see that it's in the VM's list here, and it is. And we should see that it's, uh, when we go to the 2TB Tintree VM, the storage for it should now show that it's on the 6070. Right. So, so the process was completed. Obviously, you know, we had the first one running with the two terabyte on the storage vMotion side, right? Is that is that still running, Rob? Uh, yeah, you betcha. That, yep. Yeah. yeah, that's still running. So it's it's really apples to apples. And and what what happened here? What, you know, how did we do that, right? So essentially, the VM really didn't have data, right? It was just provision space. So when we replicate a VM between the arrays, we know that there's actually no block, you no blocks used for for that. Or if there are some blocks, right? We just moved the we just moved the blocks that are needed uh, on the destination array, right? That there's a lot of dedupe that is going on in the process. There's also compression. In this case, there was really nothing to move or nothing to dedupe. So that migration between the arrays took just you know a second or two, and then we called uh, the the vSphere stack in order to execute the storage remotion, knowing that the data is already at the destination. And that's how we could move that two terabyte VM that really didn't have data inside in just a few seconds compared to, you know, this half an hour or or even more that, you know, the other VM is still uh, is still churning through. So if we, if we go back to the summary slide um, or the slides, Right, we, we've, we've. Uh, this one here. Uh, no, no, just, just a summary. Yeah, yeah. So this one. So, so instead of going through the complex workflow, I wanted to talk about these steps. Right. So the first step that we've executed, right, is we replicated the Tintree VM level snapshots. Right. So if that VM had snapshots, in our example, we didn't have snapshots. But if we had yep. snapshots, then those snapshots would be migrated. So, so maybe I can get another one going, and we can talk about this so that in the background, you know, okay. in, in interest of time, and we'll just come right back to this. Sounds good. So I can I can continue and, and uh, talk about that while you were. So the just other to follow up on our our 2016-1 um, VM that that I had done, uh, it, it had gone over pretty quick. It, it was uh, 
two minutes, a minute and a half or so, right, to, to do that. Uh, the VM itself was was very small, right? It was 10 gigs or so. Um, and, and maybe our storage motion offload is not going to help that much, you know, because it's kind of trivial to read that much data. Now, um, what we want to check, though, is, is snapshots. And uh, that guy lived over on uh, this array here on the, the 6090. And uh, I can see that now a synthetic VM is left behind, which is really just a placeholder um, because there's some snapshots and now the VM's not here anymore. So if we go to the snapshots specific to that one, and this will just uh, view snapshots, this will just put a little filter on. And you can see that all of our hourly scheduled snapshots from last night um, are now left behind on this array. The bulk of that data is left behind on this array. Now I can easily clone this and 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 create a uh a vm from it if i need to reconstruct it but if i'm trying to move this stuff off this free up space then that's really not going to help anything exactly so i need to actually delete these to get my space back now if i go over to the the 6070 uh and take a look um i will see that particular kind of mouse here uh, we'll see that particular VM is sitting right here. And if I go to uh, view snapshots, uh, I have no snapshots for it. And if I go into uh, protect, I have a snapshot policy. Now, TGC was working in the background and identified that there was a policy. It saw the storage view motion and then applied the policy to the other side for us. So that's right. one so, of the nice things that TGC will do to protect your, uh, you know, to protect some of the, the policies you put in place. But if your uh, storage is does not have a watchdog of sorts to, to be watching for things like this, to reapply policies, then, right. you know. And, and it's not, it's not just the ones that grab. I think it's also the ability to globally look at the entire footprint, right? So Tintree Global Center manages multiple arrays, right, from one, uh, from one location, right? And then you apply policies that are at the VM and not at the array, right? And that's why we're able to apply those policies. But normally, the policy won't follow the VM, right? It will just go to a new LAN or volume if you're using, you know, just any storage, right? And then it will... Uh, get the protection policy of that land and volume or volume. So I want to get another storage motion in here um, for we're done. So let me go uh, and take a look at snapshots on our 6070. We'll get rid of our filter here. And I've added a field here. It's a right click and there's lots of fields we can add. And we added a field here for clone count. So we can see which VMs uh, are logically chained to a, a particular um, snapshot. And there's one that I want to pick on here, which is uh, this, this Win 2016 uh, template. And there's uh, two clones uh, on here that are actually hanging <coughs> off of this guy. And, uh, and so what I want to do is I just want to create uh, some, some new clones from this. So what I'm going to do is go and say uh, this is going to be, uh, we will call them the, the VMUG, uh, you know, demo. And I'll create, uh, I'll create six of them. And uh, I have the option to do any guest customization specs, so a sysprep. Uh, and this is the sysprep and guest customization specs that you manage in vCenter. We pull it automatically for the specific vCenter. So I choose which vCenter it will go to which data store, and I say uh, clone. <coughs> so you can clone between vCenters if you want to. Between vCenters, uh, yeah, I mean, to remote sites, we've got a lot of very rich cloning uh, capabilities. And here's our vMug demos. They're, they're ready to go. Uh, there's six of them. Let me just power one on just to show that, you know, it's a, it's a real VM here. I'll click in, I'll go to the web console. And we can see that um, Windows is booting up, and we're in. So, so that's one of the six clones that you just. Yeah, that's one of the six, and all six were ready as soon as they showed up here. So within a couple seconds, 
uh, they're ready to go. And I'm just going to start this other one. So if I'm comparing apples to apples, it's going to be fair. Now let's take demo one and let's go and uh, take a look at its settings. And what we'll see is there's two hard disks. We have a 50 gig drive and then we've got a 200 gig empty drive. So OS and data, right? OS and data from a template. So we're going to take this and we're going to migrate the first one and we'll put it back on that 6090 and we'll leave it all as is and go. And as it turns out, our two terabyte VMware one uh, had I finished. completed, yeah. Right? Great. Um, and uh, completion time. Oh, <laughs> sorry. This the for real one. I was like, that was too fast. So it went from uh, 10, 12 a.m. to 10. Oops, it just jumped. Sorry. And it completed at um, 10:37. 10:37. Yeah. Sorry. So 25 minutes to move a VM that doesn't have any data, right? And again, you know, we're not. We're not trying to highlight, you know, issues or whatever, but that, that's how storage emotion works, right? And if you have large provision disks, right, then, then that's what will happen. So now we are, uh, we're reading data off and we're not writing yet. So we must be doing one of the blank disks, right? Uh, we'll let that go. And we'll also uh, go do it the entry way. So let's jump into that new one. It was something VMUG. Uh, and demo two. We'll take that and let's migrate it over to 6090. And the logical name of the data store in vCenter is HKTM 6090. Yeah. And migrate. What I forgot to do before this, it, it doesn't take really snaps. matter, was take some snaps. Yeah. Um, so not necessary, but you know, if, if I took the snaps, we would see the snaps would have come with it as well. And let's, um, so while, while those are working in the background, let's go back to our deck here, okay. Yeah, great. So so we have that working and back to the workflow again, you know, we had that pretty complex workflow that we summarize in four steps, right? So we're replicating the snapshots. Um, that might take a while, right? Maybe, you know, you have this huge VM, it has been snapshotted forever, right? You move that. Uh, during that time, the VM might be uh, still powered on, right? Writing data and everything. So there are some changes, right? Uh, and this is where we're going to take uh, another, right, that's step two, right? Another Tintree VM level snapshot, right? That's going to happen automatically. You don't have to do it. And then that snapshot will be replicated to the destination as well. So that captures the last uh, changes from the time you started executing the migration. This, the, the third step is we're actually going to vSphere, right? Going to the vCenter and say, okay, now we want you to execute storage remotion, right? And that's step three. That will capture the absolute latest delta um, because uh, if you notice on the uh, task list, we had a vSphere snapshot taken as part of the process there, right? So that means that if, if you're, for those of you familiar with, uh, you know, vSphere snapshots, that creates a delta file, right? So that latest um, snapshot we, that we took has the delta file and then later we can merge the, the main VDisk and the Delta file together on the destination. Uh, so this is the third step, right? We're actually uh, migrating using storage remotion, but in the process, we're telling the ESXi host that the data is already there. So all the, v, the, all the ESXi host has to do is to move the Delta disk, and then later we merge it uh, at the destination. And then the last step is we clean up, clean up all those snapshots, and then that's what you saw with you know the leading snapshots at the first fourth task on uh, the vSphere side. Yeah, we deleted on the vSphere side, which merges that delta into the base disk, and also uh, on the Tintree on the side, side, all those snaps. Once we know it's there, it's running, it's good. We clean it up 
um, so that you actually get your space back. Because if you had the snaps laying around and you were moving something off, you don't get your space reclaimed and you're still scrambling because your array is almost full. Right. So I think what I wanted to cover here is, I mean, a very important point, right, is that the, those first two steps take place without the uh, vSphere host or, e or vCenter even knowing about this, right? This happened in the back end. We haven't tasked the vCenter to do, to do anything, right? So that means that if you have, you know, a lot of data to move between the source and destination, right, that can take, you know, six hours, to, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, right? During that time, uh, the VM is manageable and you can do whatever you want with that VM. It's only that last part that uh, uses storage remotion, and that usually takes minutes, even for the largest VMs. Sorry, we were just okay. looking at yeah, uh, at any questions I... for uh, along the way. We saw some comments, and, and, yeah. and thank you for compliments there on the. Yeah, uh, and then please, I mean, please use the questions. Uh, window to, to submit those. So questions. what about non-empty VMs? I, I think I just pretty much covered this. I had them going in flight is uh, it'll do it VDisk by VDisk, right? Get one out of the way and then do another. Uh, it'll read the source uh, completely, right? Block by block. And for all the data, write that data as it goes. Um, for all the zeros it reads, it won't write those, but it still has to read them all the way to the end. And then one last element is that all the writes that are happening during the uh, VMware storage vMotion process will be mirrored to go into both arrays. So that is so that uh, you don't have a whole bunch to catch up after if you kept it at the source or if something went wrong in the operation uh, and, and you had to cancel it, then you can still run live in your source and you don't have to worry about that. So it, that's actually, you know, can take quite a bit of a hit especially if you have a work uh, a write heavy vm because now it's got to do double duty to write to two destinations while reading and writing all the contents and moving it so so this is a screenshot that just you know kind of what i was showing live but i think captures it uh you know kind of lines it up so what you may not see on the far left is uh you know the, the very first bit of uh, disk was read and there was a little bit of data written and then there was nothing and then we ran into some data on another VDisk and we wrote that and you see that our read had dropped while it was reading uh, the writing. data and writing so the, it, it didn't drop because of uh, demand on the source side it wasn't because the data we're reading uh, is harder to read than zeros it dropped because the host doesn't have the bandwidth to be reading and writing at, at the, the same, same time. Speed, yeah. And this is, by the way, this is from yesterday, 7.30, right? It's not like from two months ago. This is just this prepping is last to the night. same. Yeah, same VMs that were moving around today, right? This is this is what, you know, how the patterns look like when it's completed. This was my four by one terabyte VM. So a VM, four one terabyte drives, and the contents of those, uh, those drives ranged anywhere from, uh, I think it was, 50 gigs maybe on the low end. And I think I had uh, 300 gigs on the high end and the data was not the same in those VDisks. It was all right. different data that I had. And, and so that's why we see the different sizes of the reads, right? Um, and uh, you know, the vSphere doing the migration or executing the migration disk by disk, right? That's why the, the three groups. So, now we'll look so bad, a little yeah. deeper in the lab as we've been doing. Uh, I don't need to wait for a slide to, to get deeper, right? <laughs> I don't need an excuse for a rabbit hole. So let's let's see here. We've got our our new one that we did has completed, right? Uh, did our other complete? It probably did by now, which was VMUG demo one. It uh, did complete. It took about five minutes or so. We can see um, in the real time uh, coming across that we had a bit of writes come in here. And we can see that we had a lot of reads. So here was all the reads of all the empty stuff from the storage emotion and then the writes. Now what's interesting on the destination is 
if we were to go to our snapshots, this is getting a little deeper into some of the, the way that Tintree is working under the covers. Is uh, our, our snapshot that we cloned, our template, um, we had a clone count on there of uh, three, and then I added six more to it. So we got a clone count of, um, of, of nine, and then one of them has moved off. So our VMUG, um, if we go to our VM list, our VMUG demo uh, one and two, but particular two, the one that the Tintree moved, has been moved off and is now no longer locked in that snap. There's no data left behind for that snap. And uh, so that clone count on the snap had, uh, had decremented. Sorry, it hadn't refreshed. It dropped down here. It's now decremented. Now, if I go to the other side and take a look at um, all of our snapshots, let's add a same clone count field. So we can see a snapshot that was done to facilitate the storage vMotion offload. And if I were to look through the list here, I have this same snapshot that already exists there from some of my tests last night moving things. In fact, they actually originated on here and I moved them across to the other side. If this idea, the snapshot, is identical to the one that you have based, then it will not even move data. It will just take the data there and uh, increment it. Clone count, this has an extra one on it. It only had three, now it has four. Um, and so that's, that's a huge efficiency. So now you don't even have to move those. Now, if we were moving stuff, and uh, I took one that was not linked to any snapshots. So let's take uh, one that's not linked to a snap, which would be our VMUG demo one, because I just stored vMotion this off, right? So it has no snap linkages anymore. And I wanted to migrate that somewhere, and I move it back to that 6070. This process will start off, but what we're going to see is in our replication megabytes per second, I'm going to need to see our uh, from 6090, it's going to be the outgoing, and the 6070 is going to be the incoming. Uh, what we'll be able to see is, uh, let me go historically from some of the ones last night, is something that looks like this, where we have a... Uh, a certain amount of logical throughput, and then we have physical throughput. Now, most of these operations went too quick to show anything significant. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this was incoming. So logically, it was coming across at about 450 megabytes per second, but it was only using three megabytes per second on the wire. So how does it do this? This is a dedupe uh, optimized for WAN where we'll send the fingerprints of the blocks across to the far side, so just a little hash of it, find out if the data is already there or not, uh, and basically do our inline dedupe before we even send the stuff. So we always do an inline dedupe in our flash when you write to it, but uh, in the case of sending it over replication, we don't even need to, to do that because yeah. the so, data so I'll summarize that, right? So, so any one of those migrations, right, when we're using the replication piece to move the data around, right, we can actually leverage data that is already there in the destination array. And that's where you had with that snapshot of that template that was moved earlier. So any clone of that same template that you move around will actually won't have to move any data other than the unique uh, data that was accumulated by this new VM after it was cloned. Right, and that's that's what you're showing here. And in this case, here is the live stuff. It happened quite quickly for the replication. Um, these are 10 seconds. So it's one, two, three, four, five, about 50 seconds, and uh, great dedupe action on it. Um, not not sending on the wire. Again, we used uh, four megabytes per second on the wire, and logically, is as if we were pushing 750. So even more optimization there. So Rob, we have a couple of minutes left and uh, we actually have some good questions on the Q&A window. Uh, so thanks for submitting those, everyone. We actually had some you know, cool demo comments, so thank you all for that. Uh, I wanna start with the first one uh, that we have here. Where does VAI come into the picture? 
So that's an awesome question. Um, you know, most of you, I guess, know the VI come into play with VM migration, right? That's usually when you migrate VMs within the same array, right? So within the same array, if you have multiple data stores, right? Usually in Tintree, the whole array is one data store, but traditionally arrays will have multiple data stores. You, you want to move a VM from one data store to another, you leverage VI for that. So you actually don't need to move the bits. What we're doing here is we're actually using VAI, and you might have seen that in the detailed workflow slide. I didn't cover that. But uh, the last piece, when we actually, after we move the data between the arrays and we go to vCenter and say, okay, now execute a storage free motion, we leverage VAI to, to trick the, you know, the, 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 the process, right, and tell the, tell the ESXi host that the data is already there at the destination. So that's where we use VAI for, right? So the host needs to move a few files, right? And when it needs to move those new files between the two physical arrays, there are some files that will say, okay, moved, right? We took care of that, don't worry about it. And these are the larger files. Right, right? so that, that's the leveraging the NAS fast copy primitive uh, that's right. in there. Um, and, it is required that the VAI plugin is on your hosts. On my screen here, I just pulled up Update Manager. We can download the plugin from our Tintree support portal, create a baseline for it, apply that to your hosts along with all your other patches and stuff. Right. So, but that to that question, right? Where do we use VAI? So we use VAI that last piece, right? And that's a really, a really important point. Thanks for the question. Uh, let's see. So we have uh, we have another question here. And for what it's worth, that that other VM that we just did uh, is is done. Uh, this was one that wasn't based. Off it went. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so next question is well, we always get this one: licensing, right? What what licensing, or do you need any special license for that on the Tintree side? So uh, the good news is that there's no license needed, right? It works with any base license. Uh, on your Tintree Global Center, even though we are leveraging replication technology in the back end, you don't have to have a replication license, right? It will just leverage that uh, without you even knowing about or caring about it, right? You might know about it, but you don't have to care or license it. So that's a really good question as well. Thank you very much. And, and along those lines, I just pulled up the settings here for replication. This is the 6090. Uh, replication has not been configured on this VM store. Right. Um, so this, this is this is great. So you have lots of them. You don't have to create a tight net of fully meshed uh, replication links from every to every. Uh, Tintree Global Center takes care of automatically uh, taking care of all the replication parameters that you need, even without the replication license to uh, to, to leverage that technology to do our offload. Uh, great. And uh, yeah, so I guess there are a couple other questions which I addressed uh, offline. So I think maybe we can go back and talk about our uh, raffle um, and close it out. Danny or Candice? Okay. Yeah, great. Well, thank you both so much for taking the time to speak to us today. And like Tomer said, um, one attendee from today's webcast will win a $100 Amazon gift card. And Tintree will email their winner directly following the webcast today. So be on the lookout for that. And uh, as a reminder, you will all receive a follow-up email with the on-demand link from today's webcast. And to find out more about the VMUG webcast program, you can visit vmug.com forward slash learn. And please make sure to complete the short online evaluation that will pop up as you exit the webcast and let us know how you thought of today's session. And from all of us here at VMUG, thank you and have a great rest of your day. And thank you very much. Thank from you all. Entry by DDN.